spare our pigs. Mm, Mr. Clicky's not working again. There you go. Okay, so it's uh, chapter one of Heroes of Faith. The, we're going to be looking at the demoniac of Decapolis as our Bible hero. We're actually going to go into that story this morning. Um, champion text is, well, we'll read that later. Okay, and um, so last week we talked about what heroes were. Um, talked about how they can point us to the ultimate hero. And then we looked at the story of Jesus in the, in, in the, in the storm with the disciples and how he calmed the storm. We then concluded with by saying, why do we fear? Because we, ha we don't have faith. How do we get faith? We get to know Jesus through his word. And does it truly work? Yes, it does. We can just look at the heroes of the Bible for proof of that. So this morning we're going to get... Um, we're going to look at these questions, but at the end. So we're going to get started with the story of the demoniac. So if you have blue Bibles, open with me to Mark chapter 4. We're going to look at the end of, of the chapter where we, where we were last week, just to set the stage. So Mark chapter 4 and verse 38. We're going to start. Mark 4, 38. And it says, And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him, and they say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Remember how they were asking Jesus, um, the, the Savior of humanity, you know, or don't you care that we die? The irony of, of the situation. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the, wind, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And it says, And they feared exceedingly. Hold on to that. And said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So then they, they, they get, get to the storm, they get to the, the other side, to Decapolis, to the Gadarenes, and this is where the story picks up. And they came over into the other side of the sea, in the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now what is an unclean spirit? Anyone? What is an unclean spirit? S Satan, a, a demon, you know, just mm -hmm, an unclean spirit. So there, there, there's a man here living in the tombs with an unclean spirit. And he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains. Fetters and chains is simply a, a fancy way to say he was shackled. Like he, he, they had the the ones on the feet right here, and he had the chains. So they tried multiple times to chain him. It says, um, we ha he had often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. So they've tried multiple times to chain him, and they couldn't. It says, and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. So constantly he, you, could, you could hear these shrieking, the shrieks, you could hear this, this yelling of him just cutting himself, with stones, just crying. And this was happening every day. Now we're going to skip to verse 9 and see just what unclean spirit this man had. It says, and he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And do you guys know what a legion is? So a legion is a unit of 3,000 to 6,000 men in the ancient Roman army. So now, it, it can also be a vast host, multitude, or number of people or things. So I don't know if... if if the demon he was being, you know, exact or he was being exaggerated. But the point is, this man didn't have just one demon. He, he had many demons. He, he was filled with tons of demons. Maybe tens, maybe hundreds, maybe even thousands. We don't know for sure. But he was full of demons. So what we can conclude about this, this demoniac is that he was in a hopeless, difficult circumstance. Remember we said, we were talking about last week how the disciples were in a hopeless, difficult circumstance in the storm. So now we have this demoniac who's in a hopeless, difficult circumstance. He has an unclean spirit, many unclean spirits. And it's interesting because if you know the end of the story, when the demons then want to go to the pigs, they choose unclean animals, right? Animals that are, you know, pigs eat anything that they find and that they like roaming around in the, in the dirt. So, so you don't get possessed by living a good life. You know what I'm saying? Like this man was... was having a hard time way before the demons came along. Like, there's a reason he got possessed in the first place. 
So he had unclean spirits. He was living a, a bad life. He was living in tombs. He didn't really have any friends. The, the people he associated with, besides the other demoniac, were dead people, right? The only people he spoke to were probably just the, the demons in his head. He had chains all around. You know, he had broken these chains, but he probably had remains of, of chains all over the place. Maybe he used them to cut himself along with the stones. He was naked. Now, in the passage we just read, it didn't say naked. Beth says it in uh, Matthew 8 or Luke 8, one of the two. And he was cutting himself and constant crying. He was in a complete, hopeless, difficult circumstance. But now what's interesting is he wasn't the only one in a hopeless and difficult circumstance. Who else in this story might have been in a hopeless, difficult circumstance? Who do you think? The people living there. Think about it. The, the people living there in, 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 in the city there in Decapolis, in the Gadarenes, there was an unclean spirit there. Right? It, just as, as the, the demoniac kept the unclean spirits, the demons living inside of him, the people there had the demoniac living on their on their land, on their, their place where they were. Their real estate was gone, right? All, the, all, that, all that place where they could bury the, or put their dead or just kind of hang out, they couldn't anymore. Because anytime someone got close, you know, these ravenous individuals would try to kill them or try to attack them. Their real estate was gone. It's interesting, the demoniac, his real estate was gone, right, his mind, and the people's, their real estate was gone. Now, had tried ev their very best effort to fix the problem, but couldn't, right? It says they tried multiple times to chain him, to shackle him, or them, and they couldn't. It says no man could tame him. So naturally, they were scared for their lives. They just, at that point, just didn't go to that area anymore because it was not a safe place to be. They were, they were involved with unclean animals. Now this we'll get into a little bit later because this they didn't exactly see as a problem, but it was. And finally, they had gotten used to a rut, right? They had, they, had, they had tried their very best to fix this problem, to, get, to shackle this demoniac or the demoniacs, and they absolutely couldn't. So at that point, they just learned to live with the problem. So now, let's, let's picture this. Let's, um, I'm going to invite you into my mind's imagination here. And so you have... Right, you, ha you, you, you have these the, the disciples in the storm, right? Jesus, Jesus gets up, he, 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 I have my prop here. He, uh, he, 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 he calms the winds and the waves, right? So now you've just seen this amazing miracle, and you're, you're probably on this, like, spiritual high. You're like, this is awesome. You get to the other side, and you're like, you know, the, it, it comes to a close to the, to, the, to the sand there, or beach, whatever. And then I imagine Jesus getting, getting off first. He got off with a purpose. He's walking, and he's in, in, in this kind of slow pace, but he's walking determined because he knows something that the rest of the, that the, rest of the disciples don't. Then I imagine John and, and James immediately getting off, off the ship, like, trying to catch up with Jesus because they always wanted to be first. Then I imagine Peter, he's like fisking up something. He sees John and James. He's like, whoa, whoa wait, wait a second. He just tries to catch up with them. Like, hey, no, no, let me walk with Jesus. You got Philip and Thomas. You're just kind of like, oh. Those three, always trying to be first. And they're still kind of doing, finishing up whatever needs to be done on the ship. And they're walking, all of a sudden they hear this, sh this, th these, this yell or shriek. Like, I'm not going to shriek because I don't, that's kind of weird. But they, they hear these, these, the, this shriek like, oh. and, then, and, and they, they turn around. And at the top of this, this, the, 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 this, this kind of cliff out of the tombs are these, these people. And they're kind of looking, kind of walking like crooked a little bit. They're fully naked. They're all like, you can see cuts and, and blood all over them. You can see like dirt all over them. Their hair, their, their beard. And I think there was something about their eyes too. That they, they, there was this kind of like, you could see they weren't quite fully there. And they're kind of looking at them. And then James and, 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 and John and Peter, who are, I imagine, at the front there with Jesus, are kind of like, you know, <laughs> their legs kind of start trembling. And then we pick up in verse 5 here. In Mark 5, verse 5, sorry, verse 6, and it says, But when he saw Jesus afar off, this, this is talking about the demoniac, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran. So now the, the demoniacs are here. They kind of see them, and then they take off. Like, oh, my goodness. Just, just trying to imagine that, 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 that picture in your mind, it gives me chills. 
as I was sitting there, you know, reading this, and, and I'm imagining it, because I try to see it like a movie. I'm like, oh my goodness, like imagine. So like, this is like zombie type looking animal person just starts running at you. Now, I don't know if he took off running with two feet, like it's on his feet, or with arms and limbs. Like, I don't know if he, if he took off like an animal, but he was running, they were running fast. And so you have the, the disciples then, like, get on the ship, get on the ship, get on the ship. And then everyone's like jumping on the ship. And then you have, you have the people that were still behind, like, get in, get in. And they finally get all in the ship. And they start like kind of like trying to paddle away from, 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 from the shore. And they're like, just, come on, come on, come on. And they look over and they see Jesus. And Jesus is just kind of standing there, still walking, but with, with, this, with this look kind of like of dominion, of power, but also of tender love. And he's looking. And the, and the, and the demoniacs are running, you know, like crazy, just like ravenous. They, they have this like foam coming out their mouth. And then it says in verse 6, and he ran and worshipped him. Now a more accurate translation would be, and fell at his knees. Right, so, so, so they come, and, and as also uh, as if this, like, magnetic, like, you know, have you ever tried with magnets? When, when you put them together, they immediately stick. But if you turn it around, have you tried putting them together? They, like, you know, you can't. The, 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 there's, like, this, this repulsion that goes on. So imagine the, as Jesus is walking, the demoniacs run. They feel this, like, Ugh, they can't quite get all the way to Jesus. So they fall at his feet. Now, a quick word on this. In Mark 5 and in Luke 8, it talks about one demoniac. In Matthew 8, it talks about two demoniacs. Does this mean the Bible can't be trusted? Absolutely not. It's, ha it's really quite simple. Let me borrow someone's Bible here, if I may. Thank you. So now, if I tell you, If I tell you, there are two Bibles on that table. Is that a true statement? Is it a factual statement? No. Oh, sorry. No. I almost messed up my, my analogy. Now, if I tell you, there is a Bible on that table. Is that a true statement? Yes, yes it is. It, it's, I said there is a Bible. Is there a Bible on this table? Yes, it's a factual statement. Do the statements contradict? The second statement just merely leaves out a part of the first statement. They don't contradict. Now, a contradiction would be if I said, there is only one Bible on that table. That's, that's a false statement. That contradicts with my previous statement. But by me saying there are two Bibles on that table, and by me saying there is a Bible on that table, same thing. Now, Mark and Luke only mention one. Mark and Luke were not there. Mark and Luke later wrote about it. Now, they wrote about it under inspiration, but why? You, why did Jesus not tell them, or you know, the Holy Spirit, why didn't he tell them to write two? Well, I would say, why would he? R the reality is there were two demoniacs, but one of them was more outspoken, more outgoing. So Mark and Luke focused on that demoniac. Matthew, who was there, mentioned two demoniacs. So if anything, it actually further proves that you can trust the Bible, because the only person who was there actually, um, here you go, thank you, actually mentions two. But in reality, for the point of the story, we were, whether you have one, whether you have two, it doesn't really matter. But I started to say a quick word on that so we can further believe in the Bible. And so now, getting back to the story, the, the demoniacs are at, at, at kneeling at Jesus', at Jesus feet and Jesus is looking at them. Now, uh, I've heard some people imagine it. He puts up his hands. I, I kind of think, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I, I think, I just imagine him being more like, like just standing there. I feel like that's more like a power move. <laughs> like not even flinchy, just kind of just kind of standing there as the demoniacs come and they and they kneel at his feet. And then notice what the demoniacs say. In verse uh, seven, and cried with a light, loud voice and said, "What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God?" Now imagine like a bunch of voices overlapping with each other when he, when he's saying this, and it says, "I adjure thee by God that thou what?" Oh, come on now, nobody nobody's there. Oh, open up your Bibles, Mark five. Mark 5. How do you know if I'm telling you the truth if you don't open up your Bible? Mark 5, and we're in verse 7.
Mark 5 and verse 7. And says, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou... I adjure thee that, that, that you torment me not. Remember last week when we were talking about how the disciples asked Jesus, and we mentioned it earlier today as well. They asked the Savior of humanity, the, the person who would come to die for everyone, they asked him, do you not care that we die? They didn't really know what he was there for. Now, the demons didn't really know Jesus either because they come to Jesus and they, and they say, I, I implore you, don't torment us. They're asking the Savior of the world, the, 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 the God whose very nature, whose very characteristic is love. Very essence is love. They're asking him, don't torment us. They didn't really understand. They didn't really know Jesus. That's why he left heaven. They were deceived. And now it says, For he said unto him, Come out of the man, that one clean spirit. Then the verse we read earlier, And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And then notice this. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Right? The demons are asking Jesus. They don't want to leave. Now there, was, now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Notice what just happened. The demons, the, the tens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of demons, have a prayer request. Did, did you see that? They have a prayer request. So it's like when, you, when you're sitting around in, in a circle and you're like, any, any prayer request? You're like, well, you know, I, the test coming up, I, you know, I, I want to do good, you know, prayer request. Or, you know, family member sick, I want them to get better. Imagine, you know, it's, a, it's the demon's turn. They're like, we want to go to the, the, the pigs. We don't want to be kicked out, out, of, out of this. That, that was their prayer request. Notice then what Jesus said. Verse 13. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. Answers the demon's prayer request. No, no, no. If he's willing to answer the demon's prayer request, what makes us think he won't answer ours? Now, sometimes we don't get exactly what we're asking for. But that sympathy, has something, he has something better planned. Right? We mentioned last week the story of, uh, of Lazarus. When, when Martha and, and Mary asked Jesus, Jesus, come, our brother is sick. The brother, the one, the, the, your friend that you dearly love, he's sick, come. Jesus didn't come. Why not? He had something better planned for them. He was like, you know, I, I've healed sick people before. I know with Lazarus, I'm going to raise him from the dead. He had something better. But make no mistake, Jesus wants to answer our prayer requests. He has what's our best interest at heart. He even answered demons' prayer requests. And says, And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea, they were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. So the demons then go into the pigs. Now this is why I think there were at least um, 2,000 demons or like 1,000 demons in each demoniac. Because there were 2,000 pigs. So I think, you know, one demon per pig equals 2,000 demons. Now it, it might have been, you know, they, they uh, possessed the, the outward pigs and then the, the ones inside just kind of ran along with the herd and they just fell over. Maybe, you know, but I, I, I'm, I kind of lean more towards saying um, there probably were at least 2,000 demons in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the in the men. So now, uh, we are in verse 14. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. Hold on to this as well. Notice the, the pig feeders see what happened. And they go and tell everyone. It says, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So, so, so they, the, the pig feeders see their pigs go, go over. They go and tell everyone, and everyone comes. And when they come, they're expecting to see these, these two demoniacs, you know, all chained, all bloody, all, all dirty, nasty, trying to kill people. But they see him, and, and they find him just sitting there, you know, both, both. Both demoniacs just kind of looking at Jesus with this like glowing um, image in their, in their face. And it says something very interesting. Did you catch that? What does it say? Well, what stands out from that verse? 
Verse 15. He was sitting and what? Clothed. Clothed. Interesting. Interesting that, that, that it goes out of its way to mention that he was clothed. Why might that be? Well, I think it's for a very particular reason. Not too long ago, someone asked me, if you'll turn with me to Mark 14, someone asked me about a strange passage in the Bible, uh, two verses in the Bible, that they're like, why, you know, like, who is that? And let, let's read it. So in Mark 14, that's when, that's when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the people come, I mean, the, the, the Romans or the, the, and the Pharisees come to take away Jesus, right? He's about to get crucified. And none of the other uh, Gospels mention this, but in Mark 14, verse 50, we're going to read 50 through 52. Let me know when you're there. Are we there? Okay, Mark 14, verse 50. And they all forsook him and fled, right? All the disciples ran away. And then it mentions this. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Like, why is that there? <laughs> Who, who, who is this young naked man? And so someone asked me this, and, and, and I was like, oh, I, I got you. I'll, I'll, and I was like, wait a second, I have no idea who this is. And so I, I start looking and looking and looking and trying to cross-reference it with, with, with other verses. And I'm like, who, who is this young man? Now, scholars believe, um, I think the top two persuasive answers for myself are, one, he was either a nosy neighbor who was awake, who he was awakened by the, all the, you know, the, 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 the tumult that w- or the crowd that was there to capture Jesus. He was awakened, and he, he, it says he had a linen cloth. That was like a, a, a garment you put on when you're at home. You know, you're not fully dressed, but just kind of a linen cloth over. And he kind of went in to see what, what was going on, and the people saw him, and they grabbed him, and said, like, ah, and then, you know, they, he, he escaped, like when they grab your jacket and you escape, left the linen cloth and ran away naked. That's one theory. The, the theory I find more persuasive is that this is none other than Mark himself. Right, the author of the book. Uh, Mark was an evangelist. He traveled with, pa- with Paul for some. And some scholars believe this was his humble way of saying, I was there. Right? Just after this passage, we're going to see when Peter denies Jesus. So Mark is about to write about Peter's um, embarrassing story, so he inputs his embarrassing story as well. Now, is that, do we have conclusive proof of that? No, but I, I, I find it rather persuasive. So then I start to ask myself, if it's not clear in the Bible who this young man is, why is it there? Go to Mark 16, just two chapters later. Mark 16 and verse 5. This is when Jesus is resurrected, right? He, res- he, he resurrects, he, he's come out of the, of the tomb, and the door is open, and they, they go inside, and in verse 4 it says, Mark 16 and verse 4, it says, And when they looked... When they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side. And what does it say? Clothed. Clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. So it's interesting. This is, this is talking about an angel. It describes him as a young man clothed in a long white garment. So it's interesting that uh, in Mark 14, this young man comes to Jesus, comes close to Jesus, not fully clothed. He doesn't have it all quite together. He's somewhat clothed. He comes to Jesus and when they grab him, he runs. He goes away from Jesus and becomes naked. This young man in Mark 16, who is an angel, who angels love being in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of God, is fully clothed with a long white garment. See, over and over in the Bible, we, we see these these um, this occurrence is that when someone goes away from Jesus and towards Satan, the less clothes they have. And the, when someone go, comes to Jesus, the more clothes they have. Right in the garden, when a- Adam and Eve, before sinning, they were clothed with, with robes of light. After sinning, they realize they're naked. Right? When they, when they fall into the, the, the devil's trap, they become naked. And they realize it, and they're like, oh, we've got to do something. So they, they try to clothe themselves with, with, with leaves, and they cover just the, the, the essential parts, right? They just, you know, they, they make like these aprons, it's called. So they're not quite fully clothed, but they, they, you know, it's enough to where you don't, you're not showing your private parts. And Jesus then says, no, no, no. I'm going to clothe you. Clothes them, clothes them with animal skins, right? Fully clothed them. 
over and over again, we see in the Bible that the further you get from Jesus, the less clothes you have. The closer you come to Jesus, the, the more clothes you have. And now, this is not the main point of today's message, but I'm going to say this once. I'm going to say it, be very particular about how I say it. Isn't it interesting that in today's society and culture, fashion is, is, is moving towards less clothes? It's interesting. It's interesting. Because in the Bible, the more clothes you have is when you come to Jesus. Interesting thought. But anyway, the, the main point is Jesus doesn't want to just literally clothe us. He wants to spiritually clothe us with his righteousness. Right? So we have the, we have the demoniac who is sitting, he is sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed, and what does it say? And in his right mind, right? So he was in a hopeless, difficult circumstance. When he, uh, 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 as Jesus cast the demons out, did he have an unclean spirit anymore? No, that was gone. Was he living in tombs anymore? No. W did he have chains all around? No. Was he naked? No, he was clothed. Was he cutting himself or constantly crying? No, he was in his right mind. How many of you ha here have a lot of problems? I find myself sometimes having more than one problem, and we try to address one problem, right? We try to address the symptoms. Notice this man had a lot of problems, and Jesus, with one swing, fixes all of them. See, Jesus wasn't coming after the symptoms, this man. He was coming after the cause. Soon as Jesus cast out the, the, the devils, he fixed all of his problems. And it's interesting because why were the disciples afraid in the storm? They didn't really know Jesus, right? They asked them, do you not care that we die? They didn't really know why he was there. Why were the demons afraid? Right? When, when they come and kneel in front of Jesus and, and, they, and they say, uh, we adjure thee by God, don't torment us. What? Why are they afraid of Jesus? They didn't really know Jesus. Why did the demoniac have victory? He met Jesus. The moment the demoniac had, the moment the demoniac met Jesus, all his problems vanished. All his problems went away the moment he met Jesus. Now, we said that um, there was another person, not person, but another group of people in a hopeless, difficult circumstance. The people, right? The people of Decapolis. Now, when Jesus comes, do they have an unclean spirit anymore? No. The unclean spirits went over the, over the hill with the pigs. They were gone. The real estate, was it back? Yes. Now, the, the, there weren't demoniacs threatening to kill everyone who got close to the tombs. Now, that, that land was back. They had tried their very best effort to fix this problem, and Jesus, in a moment, fixes it. They were scared of their lives. Do they have to fear anymore? No. I mean, it, it says that they still feared, but logically they shouldn't be fearing anymore, right? The, the demoniacs, the ravenous animal human amalgamation that was happening was gone. It did not exist anymore. They were involved with unclean animals. Did Jesus fix that problem? Yes. They weren't quite too happy about that one. And they had gotten used to a rut. Jesus fixed that. It's interesting because the people of the Gadarenes, when they met Jesus, all their problems were fixed. But there was one problem that they didn't want to get fixed. The pigs. That was a part of their, their, their daily lives. That was, you know, they, they, they fed the pigs. They took care of the pigs. They probably ate the pigs. They were involved with unclean animals. And Jesus saw it fit to get rid of that. And upon seeing that, notice, read with me in verse 16. And they saw it. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine, right? The pig feeders went away. They told the people, and all the people came. They see this, this man now sitting at Jesus' feet, and they see that their pigs are gone. They, they've gone over the cliff, and they began to what? To pray him to depart out of their coast. Jesus comes in and, and fixes every single one of their problems, and they ask him to leave. No, 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 they pray him to leave. See, sometimes in life, we have problems. Sin is our main problem. And we want Jesus to help us with, with, with something. We ask Jesus, come 
solve our problems when we ask him to save our pigs. We, we, we don't want to give our pigs up, right? We're like, Jesus, Jesus, help me stop swearing. I don't want to swear anymore. And Jesus is like, okay, I can help you. He's like, well, but don't ask me to stop watching these YouTube videos that they constantly swear. Or don't ask me to stop listening to this music with swear words. No, 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 this is, this is my Jesus. We ask Jesus, Lord, help me to be more healthy. But don't ask me to stop eating my candy. <laughs> this is mine. These are my pigs. Jesus is a package deal. Are you with me? He comes in, solves all our problems. There's a, there's a moment when um, Jesus says this statement, and it's found in Luke, and, uh, among others. But he says, Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. During Jesus' life, during his historical life, he, he didn't have a, a stable home, right? He went around preaching with disciples, and he was at the mercy of people letting him in, letting him stay with them. One of the reasons that was, was to show us how that works spiritually, right? It's Revelation 3.20 says he stands at the door and knocks. He's knocking at the door of our hearts. He's asking us to let him in so, so he can live with us, right? Now, why is it that we don't see or we don't experience continual victory. Let me put it this way. How many of you have ever, you know, had a problem with sin or had a problem in general and have asked Jesus to come into your life, you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, and you have victory over that problem, right? All of a sudden, those problems vanished. You're like, wow, this is awesome. You know, you're watching that, that show that you know you shouldn't be watching. It's making you, making you think these impure thoughts. It's making you do these bad things. You're like, Jesus, I want to stop watching this. And, and, and Jesus helps you, and you stop watching the show. But Jesus is like, hey, you got some pigs there. Go, let's go ahead and delete the Netflix app. We don't, we don't need that either. And, and you delete it. That's just an example. Don't get mad at me. D d d deletes the Netflix app, and you're like, wow, Jesus is good. I, I, I have victory. And then a couple days later, you're like, there are other good shows on Netflix. Let me go ahead and get it back. So you download it back, and you're like, well, let me watch my shows, and you're watching your other shows, and you're like, eh, these aren't quite as fun as that other show. I'm like, oh, I know it's wrong, but I'm just going to watch it anyway. So you watch that show you know you shouldn't be watching, and then all of a sudden, you're watching it all day. It goes into the night, and now you're like, oh, now I'm hungry, and it's midnight. It's like 1 in the morning. We're watching my favorite show. Let me go get some food. And you get some food, and now it's gotten worse. Why is it that we don't have continual victory over sin? Go with me to Matthew 12, verse 43. Matthew 12, verse 43. Let me know when you get there. Matthew 12 and verse 43. And it says, I still hear pages turning, so I'll give just one more moment. Matthew 12, verse 43. It says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Right? When the demon is cast out, he, he goes and he's looking around and he's like, oh, looking around for a home. And he's like, oh, he doesn't know what to do with his life. Kind of like in this story. Then, he's, then he says to himself, the, the, the demon, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he comes back to the house and he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Notice. He finds it swept. When Jesus comes into your life and he kicks the demon out, he doesn't just kick the demon out. He gets rid of all those pigs causing a mess. Are you with me? All the, the pigs are dirty animals. They're eating, they're eating you know, trash all over the place. They're running around in, in mud and they're, they're leaving a mess in your house. So Jesus comes in and he sweeps it. He comes in and he's like, <laughs> you know, he's just whistling as he sweeps the whole place. He doesn't just sweep the place, though. He garnishes it. He starts setting up his furniture. He, start, he starts changing your life, puts in his home. But then notice, the demon didn't just find the home em, uh, swept. He didn't just find it garnished. He found it empty. Why did he find it empty? Because like the, the people of the Gadarenes, when Jesus fixes their, their problems but also takes away their pigs, they ask him to leave. 
When, 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 when Jesus then gives you victory and, and cleans up your mess, then you're like, ah, I don't need you. So your house is empty. So the demon comes back and he finds it empty. And it says, verse 44 of chapter 12, then he said, sorry, verse 45, then he goes, he, and takes with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Going back to our example here, you we were watching the show during the bright hours of the day. You know you shouldn't be watching it. It makes you think on pure thoughts. So you ask Jesus for victory. He gives you victory. You get rid of the app as well. Then you go back. Now, maybe, maybe you don't say the words, Jesus, leave. But don't you? By your actions. You wake up in the morning. Do you ask Jesus to come in? Or do you grab your phone and get on social media, get on whatever? You ask him to leave by your actions. You ask him to leave, so the demon comes back, wanting to see if his house is, if he can come back in. He finds it empty. He finds it swept. He finds it garnished, but he also finds it empty. So he comes back in, and he brings his friends. He's like, hey, guys, party at my house. They come in, and the state after is worse than the first. Why don't we have continual victory? It's very simple. The reason we have no victory over sin, even when Jesus kicks the demons out and takes the pigs away so all is neat, is because we ask him to leave. See, like I said before, I'm not so, con no, I'm not so much as concerned with, with just victory one day. Right when you, you, you're, it's Sabbath and you, you give your life to Jesus, and you're like, yes, I want nothing to do with sin anymore. Sunday comes along, or Sab Sabbath night, Saturday night comes along, and you're like, yeah, let's go do this. Why is it that we don't have continual victory? It's very simple. I want you all to understand this morning, intellectually, I want you to just, this be a part of your existence, your reality. You know the answer to this question now. Why don't we have continual victory over sin? Someone answer me. Because we ask Jesus to leave. So now, is there something we can do about it, right? And any time a presentation is given, we always want to know practical help, right? We want to know how does this work when the rubber hits the road, like when, when it's actually my time to live life, not just sit in a, in a room and listen to this theory, great theory. I want to know how does this actually work? How can I have true victory over sin, continual victory over sin and over my problems? Go with me to John chapter 5. Actually, not, not going to read the passage, but John chapter 5, we have the pool of Bethesda. So in this story, Jesus comes to the, the temple, right? He comes to Jerusalem, and there's this pool where people think that when, when, it, when it moves around, and that's because an angel has come in, and they, whoever gets in first will be healed. So you have this, this one person who's been sick for, he's been lame, you know, paralyzed for 38 years, and he's just sitting there, he's lying there. And Jesus comes in and asks him, will thou be made whole? Do you want to get better the, the the lame the paralyzed man then answers you know yes and Jesus says take up your bed and walk the man then gets up takes up his bed and walks now we're going to read from a book called Desire of Ages it's, it's a long passage but if you stick, stick with me we're going to see the key every nerve and muscle thrills with new life and healthful action comes to his crippled limbs Without question, he, acts, he sets his will to obey the command of Christ, and all his muscles respond to his will. Springing to his feet, he finds himself an active man. Jesus had given him no assurance of divine health. Jesus didn't, so this is what it's saying. The, 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 the lame, paralyzed man, as he's sitting down, he didn't feel the strength in his feet. He didn't feel the, whoa, I can walk, and then got up. No, 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 no. He had no assurance as he's lying there. And it's saying, the, the man might have stopped doubt and lost his one chance of healing, but he believed Christ's word, and in acting upon it, he received strength. Through the same faith, we may receive spiritual healing. By sin, we have been severed from the life of God. Our souls are palsied. Of ourselves, we are no more capable of living a holy life than was the impotent man capable of walking. Let that be clear to you, to you as well this morning. You cannot have victory over sin by yourself. You cannot fix your life problems by yourself. It's like being a paralyzed man and trying to walk. It's physically impossible. 
But it says, do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Believe his word and it will be fulfilled. Put your will on the side of Christ. Will to serve him and acting upon his word, you will receive strength. Whatever may be the evil practice, the master passion, which through long indulgence binds both soul and body. We all have a master passion. We all have these sins that we treasure. Binds both soul and body. Christ is able and longs to deliver. He will impart life to the soul that is dead in trespasses. He will set free the captive that is held by weakness and misfortune and the chains of sin. So this is what it's saying. The paralyzed man did not receive the power before getting up. He received it as he was getting up. So what is, what is the lesson there for us? The power of victory over sin, the power of Jesus it has been offered to all of us. We just have to get up. What does that mean? We of ourselves are not capable, right? Not even one bit. Our only part in, in, in this whole process of redemption is saying yes, is, is accepting. But how does that acceptance look? There are practical steps that can be taken. And that doesn't mean you're, you're saving yourself. No, no, not one bit. Because by yourself, you wouldn't be able to take these steps. For example, having devotion in the morning. When you get up, if you're, if you're too tired to, 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 to read, you're too tired to have devotion, realize it. Understand in your mind, like, I'm too tired. Why am I too tired? Well, I went to bed late last night. So make a decision. I'm going to go to bed 20 minutes earlier so I can wake up 20 minutes earlier the next morning. Make that decision. And no, you can't do it by yourself. There's someone who can't. There's someone who, who, who says, peace be still, and the winds and the waves... There's someone that when the demoniac, right, when the people are trying to capture the, the demon, and he's like, and you know, attacking them, there's someone who just stands there, and they fall at his feet. So, so then ask Jesus practically, I mean literally, you can say these words, you know, in your own words, Jesus, help me. I, I want to get to know you. And of course, if you don't want to, then you don't have to. See, the, the beautiful thing about the gospel is that Jesus didn't die merely for you to go to heaven. No, no, no. He died for you to have a choice. See, you didn't have a choice before he came along. Had Jesus not died for us, we didn't have a choice. We would be in sin the whole time. We would have no achievable victory over sin. That was our state. That was going to be our, our end result. Sin and death. But Jesus died not so that all of us would go to heaven. No, no, no. He died so that all of us could have the choice to want to go to heaven. Are you with me? See, that's true love. He did everything in his power so that we could go to heaven, but he still gives us the choice. If you want to, you can come. If you don't want to, you don't have to. It's our choice, and that power is made accessible to us. We're going to go to Isaiah 26.3 now. It's going to be our closing passage. Isaiah 26.3. This is a practical verse. I strongly recommend that all of you memorize this verse in whatever version you want. But I really do strongly recommend that everyone memorize this verse. It says, Isaiah 26.3. It says, That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is what? Stayed. Not set. Not, not, not will set. Not have set, stayed. What does stayed mean? What does it imply? Continual, right? If something stays there, like when you, when you have a puppy, and, and you're like, stay. You, you don't expect him to move around, right? When you, when you say stay, you expect him to stay. So you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Now listen, this takes practice. And God understands that. Jesus understands that. He has your best interest at heart. You, you know, if you don't have morning devotions today, or you didn't have one today, you don't have it normally, and you want to have one tomorrow, but you, you, you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm too tired. You know, make a decision. Make, make, make a, Jesus, I, I can't. I can't, but I want to. So help me. Throughout the day, you're, you're, you're tempted to watch that show you know you shouldn't be watching. You're like, Jesus, I, I can't. I, I can't not watch it. But I know you can help me. And then keep your mind on him. Say some verses. Sing some hymns. 
These are practical steps you can take. And listen, sin or most sins are like an addiction. They are going to be withdrawals. At first, it's going to be hard. I say this as a recovering addict, not from I've never once touched cigarettes, drugs, alcohol. Not, I'm, not even, I'm not even talking about things that you put into your mouth. I'm talking about things you put through your eyes. I was captive of our entertainment, the, of the entertainment industry, and I will admit sometimes I still fall. There's a lot of junk out there that I've let myself put into my system, into my body, through my eyes. And quite frankly, sometimes when I, when I have nothing to do and I'm sitting there on, on, on my couch or on my bed, I'm like, I just want to watch this show. But I know that this show has, has things that go against the will of God. I know that the, that the show will make me think certain things, and I know this will ultimately push me away from God. I also know I can't stop myself from watching it. So what do I, what do I have to do? Jesus, help me. Literally, that's, that's the practical step you can take. You're sitting there, say, Jesus, help me. I can't not watch it. I need your help. Pray. Just pray. Get on your knees and pray. He says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Pray. It, recognize that the power is there accessible to you. And like the paralyzed man, get up. Get up. Sing the song. Sing a hymn. You know, pray. And, and I promise you, it, I don't quite know how to explain it. I don't understand what exactly happened to your mind. But all of a sudden, you're not wanting to watch that show anymore. You're like, what? Cool. And then next time it becomes easier. So you see, sin sometimes becomes easier as we continually do it, right? You say one lie, and the next time it's easier to say another lie. It's the same thing with, with victory over sin. You, 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 you achieve victory, right? You achieve victory one night. You're, it's, it's, it's night, it's time to go to bed, and you want to watch that show, but you, you ask Jesus to help you, and you fall asleep. The next morning you wake up, and you're like, wow, this works. There's actually power in the name of Jesus. So the next night comes, that night comes along, and it's time for you to, to go, you know, to go to bed, but you want to watch that show, and you're like, huh, I experienced victory last night. I can do it again. Mm, sorry, Jesus can do it again. You ask him, and it happens. We're going to finish by going back to our story, Mark 5. And this is the best single piece or the best single piece of advice for keeping your mind on Jesus. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, finishing the story in verse 18, Mark 5, 18. And it says, And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Right? Jesus is going to leave, and, and the demoniac says, Please, let me be with you. Right? He's trying to keep his mind on Jesus. Jesus had other plans, though. He says, How be it, Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee and has had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all the men did marvel. See, remember before the, the pig feeders had gone and told the whole city, and that caused them to ask Jesus to leave. The demoniacs then now go and tell the whole city, and that causes people to marvel. slide. Both demoniac and pig feeders told everyone. They told everyone what happened. One caused Jesus to leave. One opened doors for them to potentially accept Jesus. It's all about how accurately Jesus is represented. The single best piece of advice I can give you in terms of achieving victory over sin, in terms of achieving, keeping your mind on Jesus, asking him continually for help, and he will help, is to share your faith. I'm not talking about just about a public setting. Like, for example, this, preparing for this, I, I love it. I, and not, not just the, the actual presentation, not just the actual, you know, trying to convey with the, the message. No, 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 the part I love the most is throughout the week, when, when I get to, to spend time. And there's that extra added, you know, help for me that if I don't prepare, if I don't spend this time, you know, it's going to be rather embarrassing when I get up here <laughs> and I have nothing to say. So there's that extra added help. But honestly, after a while, that doesn't even matter. You're just, it's just amazing to, to be able to spend time with Jesus because what I'm doing here, what I'm sharing with you is what God has shared with me. It's an amazing experience to be able to talk with God. And it's not just in a public setting. It's about just in, in general. 
you know, sharing with your friends. If you don't, you know, know all the theology, you don't know all the different things, all you have to do is Mark 5, 19. It says, go home to thy friends and tell them what? Tell them what? What did the, what did the demoniac have to tell his friends? Someone. Mark 5, 19. We're almost done. Mark 5, 19. What did Jesus tell the, the demoniac to tell his friends? What God has done for him. All you have to share with others is what God has done for you. You don't have to explain the, the 70 week prophecy to, to you know, the, the person you meet at the store. No, no, no. All you have to do is share his love. And if, and if that starts a conversation, all you have to do is share what God has done for you. Of course, you need to have God have, so, have done something for you in order to share what he has done for you. Right? But listen, what I wanted to, to, to emphasize throughout these, these, these two messages last week and this week is, number one, why do we fear when we have problems? Because we don't really know Jesus, so we can get to know Jesus. Why don't we have continual victory? Why, why is it that sometimes we only experience partial victory, only one day, and then we go right back into sin? Why is that? Someone? We ask him to leave, right? We, we, don't, we don't experience that, that complete victory because we ask him to leave. And finally, how is it that we can experience that continual victory? Keep your mind on Jesus. Ask him to stay. And if you fall, go right back to Jesus. He, the whole time he's there like a loving father. As soon as you fall, he's like, oh, come on, just knocking at the door, just, just waiting to pick you up. It, he doesn't care how much you fall and you fall and you fall, how, much, how bad you think you are. No, 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 he knew that before dying on the cross, and he still did it. Jesus is dying to have a relationship with you. No, 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 Jesus died to have a relationship with you all. So know, intellectually know that it is possible. Know that that power has been accessible to all of us, and it's our choice if we want to experience it or not. Before, before I pray, um, I know we have just a couple of minutes, but does anyone, does anyone have any questions about this? Because this is a very important topic. Does anyone have any questions? No? Do, do, we, do we understand the, that, it's, that victory over sin over all our problems is possible? Do we understand how c one can achieve it? Do I ask in Jesus? It's all what he does, nothing on us. But our part is simply to accept it, and by our, our acceptance is that continual asking him. So was this presentation clear? Did, did we, do we understand a little bit better how we can come close to Jesus, how we can have that victory over sin? Well, let's pray, and as I, as I pray, I, it is my sincere prayer that all of us will want to have a close connection with Jesus. And all of us will want to be unshackled by you know, that, that sin that has us chained. I pray that it will be all of our prayer that Jesus will set us free because he can. Let's pray. Our loving Father, once again I thank you for today. Thank you for this time that you've given us to spend together, to spend reflecting and meditating on, on your word and reflecting on how you want to give us victory over sin, reflecting on how even though we have no possible you know, way to escape, you have made a way. And Father, you have said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And let us, Father, go to you. Let us go to you continually to help to keep your mind stayed on you because we trust in you and you will keep us in perfect peace. So Father, I thank you and I praise you. I pray you be with us throughout the whole day, and then may it be a blessing for each and every one of us.